Hey, guess what? AMD is launching the 7800 XT and the 7700 XT, two of the most mid-range powerhouse GPUs launching today. Woo! <laughs> Similar price points, but my thoughts are that the prices will probably separate a little in the market over time. Probably, maybe, sort of, kind of. The biggest difference is that these cards are configured with 12 and 16 gigabytes of VRAM. The benchmarks show a bigger performance delta than I was really expecting between these two cards, but uh, you know, you can get 12 gig VRAM card. 16 gig VRAM card. I really think you should get this 7800 XT even if you're a 1080p gamer. If you're a gamer that wants to stretch your GPU as far as possible and you're still rocking something like a GTX 1060, you, what are you doing? Don't, there's so many awesome GPUs out. Or a 2060 or whatever. This is probably your four year GPU. Uh, compared with the last generation, 6700 XT, which apparently didn't tempt you, then the 7700 XT could be a pretty significant upgrade. They've been able to get the effective memory bandwidth up to about two terabytes per second on the 7700 X and about two and three quarters gigabytes per second or terabytes per second on the 7800 XT. Terabytes, not gigabytes. Both cards feature the same OBS accessible media engine, which can do, you know, VP1 decode, H.264, 265, and AV1 for encode and decode with impressive performance. It's really pretty awesome that you can do this. And full OBS compatibility, which I'll talk more about in a second. Total board power is an impressive 245 watts and 263 watts respectively, with partner models that I saw uh, having somewhat higher power usage, but not exceeding 300 watts. Some reviewers might say that AMD is at a disadvantage versus say Nvidia, and Nvidia is, you know, competing here, in terms of power efficiency, uh, but, you know, strictly speaking, I don't really think that that's true. I mean, if we're looking at performance per unit power, I think it would also be possible to use the adrenaline drivers and dial in an efficiency curve rather than a performance curve, which is what they are out of the box, and be able to beat what Team Green is doing. The only real win where Nvidia could probably post some impressive gains is via DLSS 3.0 and frame generation. If you take that into account with the efficiency, it's like, oh, it's doing this many frames or this many watts with frame generation, well, kind of, sort of. But AMD has got FSR 3, their own frame generation technology, which is a little bit more open. I think this is gonna be something that I have to visit in a future video. I do think that nearly all gamers just don't actually care about the power usage of the GPU if it's less than, say, 500 watts. Uh, the vocal minority among you, you have been seen and you have been acknowledged. But the vast majority of gamers, 500 watts and less, you don't have to have a special power supply, etc., etc. I just don't think you care. This is the perfect card to put in the Fractal Terra, the reference version of the 7800 XT. Look at this, it's so cute, it's so petite, it comes in this little tiny box. <sighs> yeah. Now go figure that. ASRock and Sapphire and XFX, they've got a lot of experience building fast, quiet cards, but AMD knows their hardware. Now the partner models, they're gonna be a little physically larger, but they're also gonna be a lot quieter and cooler. Generally, these dis GPUs are all gonna support DisplayPort 2.1, but that can vary depending on the partner model. Sometimes they can save a few bucks on the board bomb cost to go with DisplayPort 1.4 compatibility. Don't really see DisplayPort 1.4 limited cards as a downside. Now let's talk performance of the 7800 XT and 7700 XT. Testing everything basically went according to plan. The direct comparisons are the 4060 Ti versus the 7700 XT, and for the 4070 versus the 7800 XT. But I included the 4080 Tough from Asus in my comparisons because I'm a crazy person. So if you're thinking about a 4060 Ti or 4070, don't. <laughs> because these guards are generally better. 10 to 25% faster than the 4060 Ti for the 7700 XT, and uh, you know, 10, 15% faster, uh, it depends. Uh, the performance actually here is really good. All right, first up, for this card, for 4K gaming, it's actually not, it's surprisingly good. Like I wasn't expecting to include 4K benchmarks for the 7800, but it is actually pretty decent. I think long-term thinking about next gen and next, next, next gen AAA titles, uh, 4K is probably gonna be pushing it, but for older titles, 4K Ultra preset on Borderlands 3, I mean, that's an older game. Being able to stay above 60 FPS, even for our 0.1% lows, genuinely, that's very impressive. The 7700 XT falls a little behind at about 
59 FPS average dipping into the, you know, the low 50s, but still, that's pretty impressive performance. If you're willing to sacrifice the Ultra preset, or you're going to run, you know, the uh, Radeon upscaling technology, then it's not going to be an issue for you to get a higher uh, frame rate. For Borderlands 3 at 1080p, 181 FPS, how does that sound versus 163? This is one of the few benchmarks where they're, uh, you know, the 7800 XT and the 7700 XT are pretty close. We'll talk a little bit more about Hyper RX, but Hyper RX can bring up our 0.1% lows considerably and keep us to an average uh, closer to or even above 181 FPS. The Callisto Protocol, a newer AAA title at 4K, the high preset with no FSR, 113 FPS on the 7800 XT and 94 FPS on the 7700 XT. At 4K, modern AAA title. It's been out for a little bit. It's got some optimizations, not bad. 1080p, 213 FPS versus 189. Again, at those 1080p resolutions, these cards are closer together than you would think. Callisto Protocol is also pretty close. At 1440p, 173 versus 160. Uh, you know what? 4K and 1440 wide, 3440 by 1440. The extra texture memory of the 7800 XT can help significantly. And I think this is one of those titles where you can get a wider gap than 160 versus 173. But still, this performance is about what I expected. For Cyberpunk 2077 on the 4K high preset, yeah, you can do 79 FPS average with the 7800 XT. For the 1080p preset, we're talking about 193 FPS at 1080p high. For 1440p high, uh, 143 FPS. Just for the sake of completeness, we've got our Fire Strike breakdown of the 7800 XT and the 7700 XT. The performance falls about where I'd expect. You can also use this as a comparison for the 4060 Ti and the, the 4070 and see that these cards fall well ahead of of, uh, of those cards from, from NVIDIA. I mean, I've got the 4080 Tough Gaming here, which is a much more expensive card. Uh, 47,000 versus 53,000 in our Fire Strike scores. Not really a lot of practical real world difference. And you can kind of see that in our other gaming benchmarks. And we've also included Time Spy just for the sake of completeness. This is a, a thing you can run just to make sure that your system is performing about where it should or better in the case that drivers improve or, or whatever else. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is at 98 FPS average and 78 FPS average between the 7800 and the 7700. Very respectable. 1080p is 245 versus 222. Again, the, the 7800 XT is really not super busy at 1080p. You're not giving it a lot to do at 1080p, even on the highest presets, even on more modern AAA games other than Shadow of the Tomb Raider. 1440p, that's kind of in between 178 versus 153, but overall not too bad. These cards have got the goods in terms of being amazing performance at given the landscape of all the other cards you can buy. Pretty good price. Now, whether you're team green or or, or team blue or, or team red, uh, you know, the ray tracing performance at this class of GPUs is just not there. So ray tracing at this price class, yeah, yeah. And as we do this testing and we settle into thinking about modern AAA titles and how much VRAM th they will use at high and ultra settings, generally I'm seeing 10 to 15 gigabytes of VRAM used at 1440p. And given that these GPUs clock in at 12 and 16 gigabytes of VRAM, I think that's looking pretty good for a three, four, five year lifespan GPU. This is, you know, poised to become that 1060 replacement, which is nice. In the software stack, the biggest thing is that Open Broadcaster OBS is finally a first class citizen with AMD. Hardware encoding at now AV1, which is actually supported for YouTube streaming and pretty sure Twitch. I think actually some Twitch partners have access to this uh, AV1 stuff, but I could be wrong. And again, more of this is gonna follow in the future. RDNA 3 has finally attained a high level of polish and cohesion here. And I'm sure that this is welcome news for gamers and streamers alike. For creator workflows, Puget Bench, and Puget Bench has some pretty impressive scores here. The RTX 4070 and Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve. I mean, the overall scores of 9552 and 2955 respectively between the Premiere version and the DaVinci version, that's pretty good. AMD's pulling ahead of Nvidia here for creator workloads. AI is also really hot and we can sneak in some stable diffusion benchmarks here as well. Uh, listen, AI is hot, <laughs> really hot, as in how it's gonna make your GPU. 
You know, you can download Node.ai, which is a build of Stable Diffusion with Web UI, kind of similar to what I did with the Danny DeVito Nightmare Fuel video, which you should definitely check out if you haven't seen it. And so you can run Stable Diffusion on AMD GPUs with Rock-M and the suite there. It's like Automatic 111 on the RTX 4070 versus the 7800 XT. <laughs> Guess what? The 7800 XT actually pulls ahead by about 15%, give or, give or take. PyTorch and Rock-M integration is better than it's ever been, but it's even better on higher-end AMD GPUs. <laughs> AMD is moving at breakneck pace here, but they've still got a little bit more work to go on the AI side. But if you want to download and play with Stable Diffusion, check out Node.ai and the, the AMD branch of that. Oh, I've got a fever. And the only prescription is HyperRx. <laughs> with apologies to Christopher Walken. Going forward, HyperRx, it's gonna be a bigger deal than I thought. It's a single click to tune supported titles for Boost, Anti-Lag, FSR, FSR3, whenever that comes out, Radeon Super Resolution, whatever applies to the particular situation that you're in. Uh, of course, FSR3 when, when that's ready. One click free performance, it's hard to incorporate that into a benchmark because, well, apples to apples comparisons are right out the window. We just wanna know what the raw performance of the hardware is. The software just makes the gravy on that even better. It's just extra more gravy. If you're just gaming, it should be on. I tested it extensively with Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Cyberpunk 2077. With HyperRx on and FSR in quality mode, I could bring my frame rate to over 120 FPS in Cyberpunk 2077 while improving the input latency beyond just the improvement from the increased frame rate. How does that work? Uh, driver optimizations and some settings. For competitive games like Fortnite and Apex Legends, yeah, those are also supported. And it's really impressive to see AMD's vision for how HyperRx is supposed to work coming together. It's clear that AMD is actually spending a considerable amount of engineering effort to improve the situation for gamers so that they can just hit a button and get free performance. And largely HyperRx so far is living up to what has been promised. So a little bit more and a little bit different than what I can show off in this review video, but if more frames are more better and you don't want to fiddle with game settings too much, HyperRx is probably what you want. Just toggle it on in your adrenaline drivers and you'll be glad you did. Overall, personally, I think AMD has knocked this one out of the park. I mean, Nvidia is kind of checked out at this point. I mean, they're the dominant player in the gaming GPU market but between how they've launched the 40 series, how they've named things, the writing on the wall with the future, how much longer can Nvidia even really care about, you know, having a gaming focus? Their focus has got to be elsewhere because machine learning and commercial interests is where all the money is. Uh, gaming? Uh, are there any software or driver issues holding AMD back at this point? For one, I'm really surprised that RDNA 3 ray tracing performance still lags behind what Nvidia has been able to do with their hardware. As far as I can tell, AMD's got the goods on the hardware side. I mean, look at the raw AI math and what AMD is able to do once all of that gets in place. I mean, the AMD is clearly ahead in the performance unit per dollar here. The software suite is generally pretty mature at this point from, from AMD, but there's maybe a couple small pieces missing here. Now, the gaming performance, though, was pretty good. I actually only saw a couple of weird things in F1 2023 in the rain scene. There was maybe some barely noticeable texture glitching. And I also experienced a problem with Cyberpunk 2077 where the shadows in Cyberpunk 2077 seem to maybe enable some translucency of the texture or the object behind it. Some weird visual artifacting like that. But this issue seemed to be related to reloading a saved game, then running a benchmark, but without actually restarting the game. So it was very difficult to reproduce. I went over those issues with AMD and they reported that they have fixes in the works already for those issues, which is pretty encouraging. Now, just to make absolutely sure, we retested F1 2023 on a fresh install with an NVIDIA card and surprise, surprise, we found it was doing the same thing with an NVIDIA card. Yeah, it turns out this must be an F1 2023 update. See, we, we sort of get a little bit of an advance warning that these cards are coming. And so we will start testing with the GPUs that we have on hand. Well, in the time that we started testing, when it didn't do this, until the time the cards actually showed up and we installed the driver, the game started doing this. So this is a game problem, not an AMD problem. The shadow issue still exists with Cyberpunk 2077, but it's super minor and almost completely unnoticeable. And historically, the NVIDIA drivers have had the uh, twinkle sparkle problem with Cyberpunk 2077 specifically. 
This is a tiny inconsequential nothing burger. Uh, subjectively, my experiences with AMD cards in general over the last year, 18 months, have been awesome, especially for the 7000 series, although I've been using 6 and 7000 series GPUs pretty extensively. They are clearly the best value and well-supported cards in the market today, I think. In case you're wondering about Linux support, it's also pretty good. Check out the level one Linux video coming in a day or two, probably day after tomorrow, give or take, on getting these things up and running in a Linux environment. Overall, good job team AMD. Pretty impressive. Everything's coming together. If you have any problems or weirdness or anything that you want to report, definitely check in at the level one text forums. I'm Wendell. This is level one. I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums.